So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you haven't filled out the poll yet, uh, looks like most of you have. We're just uh, trying to get a sense of um, how many of you have done this before or uh, how many of you are new at this. Uh, our original intention for this workshop was to have it be in person and more targeted towards our team leaders to give an, uh, an opportunity to come into the lab and actually examine specimens and even learn some idea of the different stonefly families. Uh, we're still going to go over that today. Um, obviously, that what did Stu call it? A cyclone bomb that weather that hit yesterday uh, made us think it would be better off to go virtual, and it also allowed us to invite um, more of you who some of us see. Let me let me end this poll here. I'm assuming everybody's filled it out, and then I'll share the results. Um, so it looks like uh, five of you have never done this before. So. Um, so we'll keep that in mind as we talk through this. Um, seven of you have done this one to three times, and seven of you have done this four or more. I I wonder if some of you are like me and say, well, I can't even remember. I, I have to go back and count all the times that I've done this. Uh, so uh, we close that poll, and then um, can you see the presentation okay? Yep. Okay. And Sam, yes. you're doing the recording, so however your uh, Zoom looks in terms of seeing people's faces and things will be what is recorded for it. So, um, so uh, uh, anyway, um, let me start by introducing our uh, four presenters today. I guess I'll start with myself. I am Sally Petrella. I'm the watershed ecologist. I've been with Ben Rouge now going on 24 years um, and uh, got this program started. Uh, I am now part-time, so I'm more supportive on this programming. And I'll turn it over to Lauren. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Eaton. I'm the monitoring manager here. I am without power, so I'm wearing my indoor winter jacket. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I'm disappointed that we couldn't have this in person, but um, I'm, you know, excited to go through all of this and um, meet you all next week. I just wanted to put a quick plug into the, um, this website, macroinvertebrates.org. I put it into the chat and there's also an app that you can download called Pac Pocket Macros. I use it all the time. It has a really wonderful, a lot, a lot of really good, um, like photos and it's got a, um, dichotomous key and ID key that you can go through um, to kind of figure out what or uh, bug that you have. So I, if you wanted to check this out as we're talking and they have the stoneflies we're going to be talking about, so you can kind of click through the photos as we're talking about them. Um, but anyway, so yeah, welcome. And um, I'll turn it over to Sam. Good morning, everyone. I think I've met many of you and for, is my video showing up for everyone else? Yes. Yes. Okay. I couldn't see myself. So I just want to make sure I wasn't a uh, disembodied voice, you know, shouting through the void. Um, again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for hopping on in this uh, frigid and very snowy morning. Um, we are very happy to have you here for our 2024 Stonefly Search Refresher. Um, and, you know, it's it's a really great event. It's a really um, unique experience for those who have not, you know, come out with us so far. Really excited to have you here for the first time. And um, my role here is to sort of just help out with the event wherever I can, make sure that you all are um, set up for success and having a fantastic time. So um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, and we would be happy to get you some answers. And then I think we're going to Sue. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, wel welcome to the um, Stonefly training. Um, glad you are all here. Um, and I do thank Friends of the Rouge for helping or uh, inviting me to participate uh, with this and in, in support. Um, but I'm a longtime uh, Friends of the Rouge uh, Stonefly Stonefly Searcher. I'm also a member of Friends of the Rouge Board of Directors um, and also in my um, 
full-time role at Wayne County, uh, partnering with Friends of the Rouge with uh, doing uh, back, benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring and stonefly searching, um, and also doing um, benthic monitoring across uh, across uh, Wayne County. So I'm very excited to be here. and This is always one of my favorite, favorite events. Thanks everybody, we've got a great team today. So um, just a little bit of background on our program. Um, this program is coordinated by Friends of the Rouge and, uh, since 1986, and it's our mission to restore, protect, and enhance the Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education, and collaboration. And we rely on people like you that are willing to give of your time um, Sam, Lauren, and I work on the monitoring programs, and um, we really appreciate uh, you giving of your time to help collect this valuable data. Uh, we have quite a few different monitoring programs. They're growing. Um, some of you have participated in our uh, listening survey, our frog and toad survey, um, our fish surveys. Uh, we've really expanded into doing some uh, monitoring for invasive species. Uh, I know at least one of our interns from last year uh, who monitored red swamp crayfish. Uh, Jacqueline is on today, and I don't know if Gwen is on too. Um, uh, this year, we're going to be doing some more extensive chloride monitoring as a follow up to some of the data we collect as part of this event. Um, and then we're also doing some quadrant monitoring to look at where roads cross the river to see if the culverts are impediments for the fish coming upstream. So lots of good stuff going on. Um, this stonefly search is part of our benthic macroinvertebrate program. Uh, so we do a spring and a fall bug hunt where we are looking for all of the macroinvertebrates. Um, as a way to assess the quality of a stream and um, you know, every different type of bug uh, critter that lives in the, in the stream has a different sensitivity. So when we do the spring and fall bug hunts, we actually come up with a number to say whether the site is good, fair, poor, excellent. Um, for this event, the stonefly search, we're just focusing on one um, type of benthic microinvertebrate, the stonefly. Over here and go to the next slide. Um, this program is made possible um, through generous support from the Alliance of Rouge Communities. Uh, they're a nonprofit made up of a lot of governmental entities that work together to improve the Rouge River watershed. We also get general operating support through the Herb Family Foundation and then Washtenaw County Water Resources Division support from the um, and I guess I don't have a slide in here, but um, I am hoping that most of you are members of Friends of the Rouge. Uh, if you are not, we highly encourage you to become a member just to help ensure that we can continue programs like this. Uh, so today, like I said, we um, have altered this slightly because we were intending on doing this in the lab. Um, so basically, we're going to uh, go over stoneflies in general, why we look for them, and some of their biology. Um, the procedures that we use on our stonefly search day, which is next Saturday the 20th, that I'm assuming all of you are signed up for. Um, and then talk about how do you know whether it's a stonefly or not. Um, and then if you want to do a really deep dive into, okay, I know it's a stonefly, we actually have five or six different kinds in the rouge. Uh, how do you tell those apart? So that's for people who are real bug nerds, um, but it's really kind of interesting information. Um, okay. And, um, so, stoneflies. Um, yeah, these are what they look like. They're not really very exciting. Uh, in some watersheds up north, they're they're fairly large. In the Rouge, uh, we are a very urban watershed. We don't have as much of a variety, so it's going to be really small. Um, actually, the picture up on the left is from Sue Thompson's work up north, so some bigger, fuzzier ones. Um, the picture on the bottom is from one of our sites last year. Those are some of our slender winter stoneflies. And you can see some of them don't even show the wing pads too well. 
Um, and then there's a close up on the right that's showing you some of the characteristics. So that is what you will be looking for. Um, stoneflies. So stoneflies are in the order Plecoptera and um, Plectos, uh, Plecoptera, Pleco comes from the Greek word uh, that means twisted or braided and uh, Pateran, uh, the, the PLO, the, I mean the P-T-E-R-A comes from wings, so braided or folded wings. So on the right, you see a picture of an adult stonefly, and you can see how those wings maybe looked braided to somebody who decided to name these things. Um, so that is the adult, and if you are really, really lucky, you might see some adults walking along the snow when you're out on the 20th. It's happened once or twice in our 22 years of doing this event. Um, what we are looking for is actually the nymph, the, the stage of the stonefly that lives in the river. So just a little bit about their life cycle, and I don't really know where to start here, the chicken or the egg. So I think I'll start with the nymph uh, because that's what we're looking for. So. Nymphs spend uh, one to two years in the stream. That's where they do a lot of feeding uh, when they can be active. And um, there's there's winter stoneflies and there's others that are more active in the summer. The winter stoneflies actually hatch out in the winter time. That's what we're looking for. Uh, so when they reach maturity, they crawl on out of the river and then their skin kind of splits open and they eventually hatch into these flying adults. The flying adults are flying, or they don't do a whole lot of flying, more walking. Um, and they're very dark to help them uh, heat up their bodies um, in the snow. Uh, it's a pretty short period of their life where they it's all about just mating. And then the female will deposit the eggs into the river, which will drop to the bottom and eventually hatch out into the nymph. So just a little bit about stonefly biology. Um, the winter stoneflies that we're looking for, um, they, you know, when you think about bugs, it's really unusual to be hatching out into a fly in the dead of winter. Um, so one of the, the reasons they probably adapted to doing this is because it's a good time to avoid predators. A lot of the things that are eating the bugs are not as active. Um, what do they eat? So uh, some of the stoneflies are herbivores. Uh, so you find them in what we call leaf pack. And there's a great picture on the right of the decayed leaves that you find in the river. It's such actually great habitat for a lot of our benthic macro invertebrates. Um, and uh, um, some of our stoneflies are what we call shredders. So they shred up the, the leaves and, and eat that. Um, and our most commonly find, found stonefly, the slender winter stonefly, Cacnea day, uh, is a shrub. So it's a great place to look for them. Uh, we also do have some carnivorous stoneflies. Uh, and they, they, they actually, you can find them in those leaf packs because they will be looking for the slender winter stoneflies to eat them. So uh, the picture on the bottom is uh, it's, uh, promoted. Uh, it's, uh, that's a predatory stonefly. Um, so you will find them in the leaf packs and the woody debris. Uh, you also might find them crawling around on the stones. That's the stonefly name. Um, and then how are they adapted to living in the stream? Because all of the benthic macroinvertebrates are adapted to a fast moving stream by maybe preferring to live in the pools, um, floating on top. The stoneflies are sprawlers and clingers, so they are adapted to being able to survive in that climate. A little bit about their biology. So uh, they get their oxygen. Um, some of them have gills, and you can see the picture on the right, some sort of furry gills. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse there, but see, these are some of the gills. Right there, kind of uh, on the, the belly um, under the legs. Um, but they also absorb oxygen from the stream through the integument, which really just means like their skin. Um, so bugs like that that get their oxygen from the water rather than air breathing need really high levels of dissolved 
sinking in the water. And when you think about everything that's happening in the urban environment, with, uh, even just the urban heat island, heating up the water, um, all the fertilizer, things going into the water, sediment, um, clogging their gills, all those things make it very difficult for these animals to survive. So um, if you're not finding them at your site, you think about all those things that are happening at your site. Um, Stoneflies go through what we call incomplete metamorphosis, uh, which just means they have three stages rather than four, the, um, the egg, the larva, the adult, so the egg, the nymph, the adult. Uh, they don't have a pupil stage. The other way you know it's incomplete is that the larva pretty much resemble the adults. Uh, they they um, live one to two years as a nymph in the stream before they emerge. So uh, where do we find these stoneflies? Uh, this is a map showing every site that we've looked for stoneflies at. And um, if there's a blue diamond, that means we have found them at one point in time. Um, I need to make another map that shows you how often, because some of these sites, we find them every year. And some of the sites, it's just been once or twice. So the vast majority of our stoneflies are found in this uh, part of the Middle Rouge. It's a tributary called the Johnson Creek. It's a cold water tributary. Uh, we, it's a hotbed for stoneflies as well as downstream into uh, Heinz Um But it's pretty scary right now because of all the development that's going on in the stream that's going to make it really difficult for those stoneflies to continue to survive. Um, we also find them in um, on the tributaries of the lower Rouge. So uh, out in Canton, Superior Township, we've got Fellows Creek as well as Fowl Creek. <clears throat> a pretty good population there. Um, we have found them in Tonquish Creek. That's one of the places where even though you see three blue dots, uh, Plymouth Township Park and uh, a couple other sites downstream, it's only been once or twice. Um, so if we send you to a site like that, you're going to have to search really, really hard. And then we also do find them in the upper branches up in Seaweed Creek and then further downstream in Shiawassee and Heritage Park in Farmington and Farmington Hills. Um, we sampled for years in the main branch, uh, Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills, and after sending people there repeatedly, um, have decided there's something about the main branch, it's maybe too warm, we don't find them there. But we did have one fluke um, back a few years ago uh, where Sue was out sampling in Detroit at eight mile and found them in the main rouge. Um, it's uh, one of the, uh, it was a Teneopteryx. It's one of the stoneflies that are adapted to larger rivers. Uh, and then we also did find them hatching out at the concrete channel down on the main branch. Um, so, you know, as water quality improves, um, hopefully they will be um, returning. You know, this stretch of the Rouge has undergone massive amounts of improvement but still has some issues with combined sewers and other things that we're continuing to work on. Um, so that is it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to, I'm not sure if it's Sam and or Lauren to talk a little bit about what to expect the day of. I will be taking this one over. Um, so for the morning of our event, um, we will all be meeting at the Plymouth Cultural Center at, I think the address is 525 Farmer, but that'll all be in the uh, informational email uh, going out prior to the event. Um, all of the teams will sign in and they will get, uh, you know, paired up with their team, their other team members and their team leaders. Um, you will receive your team's equipment um, and we'll sort of go over a little presentation, uh, a welcome to the event, um, and just go over one more time some of the uh, procedures for the day. Um, finally, before we let you go, uh, we'll discuss what sites you're going to, how to get there. Um, you will be given maps and, um, you know, different, different directional tools to make sure you're getting to the right place. Um, 
and your team will have the option to share phone numbers with you, with each other just in case anyone gets lost or you know you, you need to contact each other um so to go into a little bit more depth for the equipment um for any team leaders who have done this before uh it's pretty much all the same but to summarize for for anyone who uh might not know uh, all of the sampling is done using a triangular dip net. Um, so it's just a net with a long handle. So you will receive that um, as well as a whole tote bag of equipment uh, that has things like uh, tarps to sit on if, if you don't have a table. Um, it will be, um, we might throw some ponchos in there in case you get really wet, but definitely, uh, you know, dress for the weather, boots, coats, gloves, um, you know, warm water bottles aren't a bad idea, uh, things like that. Um, your team will also get a stack of white trays that you might have seen in previous photos. That's where the, the samples get dumped into. And then uh, volunteers are able to pick through with uh, tweezers and plastic spoons and, and different tools that are also uh, provided. Um, so once we finish up at the Plymouth Cultural Center and your team heads out to your sites, um, there will be a form telling you which site to go to and we will be sure to uh, you know, touch base before you leave to make sure you're, you're going to the right place. Um, your team leader will, will orient your team for um, you know, what the expectations are for that site where you're gonna set up, where they're going to be sampling and sort of like a workflow around that. The, uh, the general uh, procedure is uh, the team leader will have waiters and will get in the water to collect samples with the dip net. Uh, and then volunteers will be able to ferry trays, those white trays back and forth um, as samples are available. Take them back to a table as pictured here uh, and pick through the samples whenever you find any stone flies that uh, we wanna keep then you'll put them into an ice cube tray to keep them separate from any samples that, you know, once they're all picked through, they end up returning to the river. Um, and that's, that's the, the general, uh, the general sense of things. We will do this for about half an hour, uh, 45 minutes. Uh, and then the team leader will come back, uh, help, you know, make sure that all of the samples are preserved that we want to keep and um, help fill out data sheets. Um, <clears throat> so as listed on here, um, you will want to get a water temperature using the thermometer um, before the team leaders start sampling. Um, and then there are a few um, additional readings like the uh, salt and the nitrate that we will want to get first before um, we we muddy up the river too much. Um, so we will get into the salt readings here in the next slide. Um, so one one initiative that we've been taking part in the last couple of years um, is using these salt tabs from the Isaac Walton League of America. Um, they are a great and simple way to get data on how much chloride or, um, you know, what's left over from road salt that washes into the river um, is present in that stream at that time. So um, you will be given a strip as pictured on the screen on the, uh, the right side of the card there um, and an instructional card to tell you how to do it. But um, basically... You have a little cup in your bag, rinse it three times with river water to make sure that there aren't any contaminants or anything that's going to mess with the readings. Um, fill that cup up with about an inch of water from the stream. And then you just place that test strip uh, with the, uh, the side that has the one down um, into the cup and let it sit there and soak up the water. Um, and you'll be able to see as, as the, uh, the sample is progressing, um, the water will travel up this, what is originally a orangish red test strip. Um, and as it gets light, yeah, Sally's 
Sally's showing us here as it gets as it gets light um and you can see that traveling up the strip um that is what we're going to use to um read this this result um so after about 10 minutes um after the the line at the top of the tab turns black originally it's orange it will turn black when it is done um you will then read up the strip to where the uh, light part stops. Um, so on this one, I'm reading maybe like a 4.4, 4.6. Um, then you will write down that number on your data sheet in the proper area. Uh, and then you'll be able to use this chart to translate that from Quantab units, which is the, the units used on this test strip over to parts per million the uh, farthest right column there. Um, there is an emphasis on making sure that you don't um, read any results after, I think it's 15 minutes, uh, just because the longer that this test strip is going to sit in this water, um, the higher those readings are going to get. Um, so keep an eye on it and um, read, it, read it soon after that line at the top turns black. Um, so once, once you get your reading, you'll, you'll have a little bit of an idea of what that means here. Um, you know, less than 150 parts per million, uh, of chloride is, uh, considered, or is, excuse me, greater than 150 parts per million of chloride is considered chronic effects. So, um, you know, long-term, um, uh, exposure to this could be harmful for any organisms living in the stream. Um, greater than 320 parts per million, um, those are acute effects. And um, these are harm, harm is happening right here, right now uh, with these organisms being exposed to this amount of chloride. Um, in this map here on the right-hand side of the, of the slide, uh, you can see some of our, uh, our results and then also some results from uh, the Isaac Walton League of America collaborative, um, which multiple states uh, participate in. Um, so going from green to red, um, red are our acute effects. And then I believe green is um, anything less than 150, which is, is uh, passable. Um, so we do often find higher readings of chloride in the rouge. Um, and that is something that uh, we are trying to address through uh, current programming and also just general education, making sure that people are uh, you know, using the proper amounts of road salt at the proper times uh, and minimizing the impact to local streams. Uh, but any data gathered from this, it's, um, it's building all of this evidence to say, hey, here, you know, here is a problem um, that really needs addressed if we want to continue to restore um, our, hot our hometown river. Um, so thank you for, for contributing to that by, <clears throat> by participating uh, in this event. Uh, lastly, um, we will also be doing nitrate and nitrite testing um, nitrates and nitrites, they are, um, they are chemicals, um, and nutrients that can be, uh, added into, um, or contributed to the stream from a lot of different ways. Um, one way that might come to mind most readily for people is, uh, through fertilizers and things like that. Um, and then, uh, could also be from, uh, water treatment practices. So, um, what we want to do is to sort of build a data set, like I had mentioned with the salt, just to explore what these what these uh, readings might be like in the rouge um, and assess if there's any issues with them. Um, so using test strips from the same organization, the Isaac Walton League, um, you will be you know, finding readings for the site that you go to. Um, and the procedures for this one, it's a little bit different. Uh, whereas the salt, you have a cup and you let the test strip sit uh, in the water for a couple minutes. Um, this one will be a very quick dip of the test strip into the stream. And then you hold the test strip uh, horizontal uh, so that the 
um, chemical reading pads are facing up. Let that water sit on them for, um, I believe it's 30 seconds. And then you can then read from uh, the, the card that we will give you. Um, this is a color comparator. So the, the color that each of these pads turns, then you can match it to the color of um, the, the testing card um, as shown in the picture on the left. Um, the top pad is for nitrates and then the, the pad that's closer to the middle of the, the strip is for nitrates. So you'll be testing for both in this one strip. Um, so once you have waited your 30 seconds, uh, you can go ahead and match up each of those uh, pads separately um, to the their respective um, test and then record those results on your uh, data sheet as well. Um, and then just to... <laughs> Sam, just let me thing. know if you want me to switch ahead. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, just to give you an idea of like, you know, you're going to get these readings. What? Okay. So I got, I got a nine. What does that mean? Or I got a 12. What does that mean? Um, so in this less than, um, less than 10 parts per million uh, is an okay uh, range, but greater than 10 is uh, harmful to aquatic life. Um, so, you know, the, once you get into the the fuchsia area of the nitrates, um, then then you're going to start seeing some impact to aquatic life in the stream. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just to go over some more fine detail for uh, sampling. I can, uh, I can do this part if you want, Sam. Oh yeah, sorry, I lost track of, of what slide number we were on. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of a, a view of what the river will look like um, or could look like, especially since it's going to be, you know, cold and icy. And so um, just to remind everyone that it is going to be really cold. So wear warm clothing, layers, gloves, hats, all of it. Um, make sure that there are times when, you know, the, the water in the trays could freeze. And so it might be nice to bring like a warm uh, bottle with some warm water in it or multiple bottles with warm water, um, even just to keep your own hands warm. So for the, the team leaders that are going to get in the water and do the sampling, we always work from um, downstream to upstream. And that's because you're kicking around and moving stuff around. And so the things can flow downstream. Um, and so you want to work, you know, work your way up, up the um, site. And then you want to collect from all available habitats. And then we have a, a particular emphasis, especially for stoneflies on leaf packs and riffles and stones. And um, that's because some of the stoneflies are shredders, some are predators that are going to be stalking the other um, bugs in the in the leaf packs. And so it's good to try to collect um, from leaf packs and riffles and stones especially, but just to keep in mind that they could be um, anywhere really. And so you want to hit as many habitats as possible. And so just, um, Sally had mentioned this, but just another reminder that the Taneopterigid larvae are found near coarse sediments, debris accumulations, and leaf packs. Um, the Capneidae, those are the, the most common ones we find. Those are the slender winter stoneflies, and they are the shredders and detritivores. So the detritivores mean that they eat rotted dead plant material. And so again, they, they really like those leaf packs. So to really kind of dig around and collect the leaf packs. The Capneidae, they can also be found in flowing water beneath the rocks and gravel. So again, to, to um, target those kind of riffle areas would be a good thing. The other ones we find are the perlid stoneflies. Um, and they uh, can be found like clinging to different substrate. They are the predators. So again, they'll be stalking the other um, the other bugs in the river. So they could be in the leaf packs too, and then in the woody debris looking for other aquatic um, insects. And they're, um, they can sometimes, because they're particularly sensitive or their oxygen requirements are, are really high, they can be the ones that sometimes do the little push-ups. They, it looks like they're doing push-ups on like a, um, a branch and it's because they're trying to get the water flowing um, through their gills. 
And then finally, the other one that we find um, occasionally are the perlodids, and those are predators as well. And so they um, are often clinging to like substrate, plants, other materials in the stream. And so um, it's a good to, to look for them as well. Oh, and then we find um, very rarely we find Nemoridae. And they usually prefer smaller rivers, streams, and springs. And they're often found in leaf packs, wood, or other coarse sediments. Um, so again, they're generally like shredding detritivores. And so they'll be in the leaf packs as well. So the whole goal is to collect the stoneflies. That's the whole purpose of this. Um, and so we will provide you with a labeled vial with some ethanol in it. And it's a pretty small vial. And we're basically just hoping that we find stoneflies. And so it's not necessarily an abundance thing. It's more of a presence absence thing for stoneflies. And so you don't have to collect, you know, a hundred bugs. We just want you to collect a representative sample. So if you're finding a few different types to collect the different types, but you don't necessarily have to fill the vial up with a ton, a ton of stoneflies. It's just, we're just checking to see if they're in these sites that we're sending you to. Um, we, yeah, collect um, the stoneflies, identify them as best you can, and we'll go through um, some, some commonly confused critters here in a bit, and then Sue will go through the, the family level identification. We want you to complete the forms to the best of your ability, and the next slide is a, um, the actual form itself. And we're collecting a lot of data at the site, but um, it's really useful for us to collect as much as possible. And particularly as Sam uh, went over the chloride and nitrate are things that are particularly useful for us. Um, so you just want to make sure at the end that you've checked and rinsed your equipment. We don't wanna bring you know critters or anything from one site to the next. So just make sure to rinse everything as best you can. And then at the end, at the very end, um, if the team leaders or someone volunteers from your team to return the equipment to the Friends of the Rouge garage. And Lauren, just to, to add one more thing, as far as the sample collection, um, you know, make sure you have the, the vial for the right site. Um, we don't really want anything but stoneflies for this event. So if you find other stuff, just put it back, um, you know, with the exception of if you find something really unusual or you're, you're not sure if it's a stonefly or not, then feel free to put it in the jar. But, um, you know, we, we're not looking for the other benthic macroinvertebrates. We're not going to be tracking them or really doing anything with them. So this is your data sheet. Um, you'll fill out the, yeah, make sure you're at the, you know, have your field ID, the site name, date, the start and end time, um, we'll go through the, the water temperature, any unusual weather conditions, um, your team, and then the person that is in the water will um, kind of check to make sure that they've gone through all of the different habitats. So the riffles and cobbles, which are particularly important for stoneflies, the plants, runs, margins, the leaf pack, again, target the leaf packs a lot. Uh, pools, undercut banks, and submerged wood. And then we've got boxes for the, the chloride and nitrate. The chloride, you want to put down the quantab units and the parts per million. And then the nitrate, nitrite are just the parts per million value. And then if you, whether or not you've collected the, um, the stoneflies or not. And then if you can, write down any other benthic macroinvertebrates or fish or like Sally said, anything unusual that you may see um, around. And then if you've noticed any potential problems at the site, um, and then that's particularly if you've noticed any um, like illicit discharges, which I think is on the next slide. And we also provide you information on um, who and what to look for and who and what to contact if you do see an illicit discharge. So just like this slide says, be an alert observer, kind of take in the surroundings, look for any, you know, like pipes or drains or anything going into the river, and then um, you can report it. And again, it'll be in your clipboard instructions on if you do uh, find anything. We're not hoping that you do find anything, but just in case um, to, to report any anything suspicious. And feel free also to call us if you have yes. any questions in, yeah. the, in the field. 
So go into a little bit just of the general stonefly identification. Um, a lot of, of these things are, are really small and you'd need a microscope to see these features. So our goal here is just to give you as much kind of background and things to look for as we can. And the main thing, um, again, is just to be able to tell stoneflies apart from the other macroinvertebrates that you're going to find. And so stoneflies, like most bugs, have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen as their basic body parts. They have the two tarsal claws, which are basically their toes, um, which is kind of a diagnostic thing for them. But again, it's difficult to tell um, just with your, with your blind's eye. The stonefly mouth part anatomy can help with family level ID. So there's um, a certain portion of their mouth that either um, kind of are of equal length or unequal length. And so that can be um, to tell them apart and whether they're a, a predator or a uh, shredder. They have two sets of wing pads that can either be um, parallel to their body or divergent and uh, Sue can go into that a little bit more in the family um, identification later. And then the, the most important thing or the thing that I look at the most are the long, two long tails and then generally longer antenna. And that can tell you that you are most likely looking at a stonefly. So in our opinion, these are the ones that could be most often confused with stoneflies because they all kind of are have a similar-ish body and they have tails that could be confused um, for a stonefly. So the top left is a mayfly. <clears throat> and oh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of these body parts are, are fragile. And so sometimes, you know, we're being really aggressive with the net and trying to dig in and get as many bugs as we can. And so sometimes the things that we're looking for could be broken off or damaged. And so that just makes it that much more difficult. Um, but in, if everything is intact, the top left is a, is a mayfly. They have um, three tails. They, you know, have a similar body shape. Um, the top right is a damselfly. It has three, they're called caud caudal lamellae, which are their, their gills actually. Um, and then the bottom right is a, a, a dragonfly. And we'll go into a little bit more um, these different things in the next couple slides. So I would think probably the most confused one with stoneflies are mayflies. And so the mayflies, they have one tarsal claw um, and if you remember, the stoneflies have two. Um, again, it's difficult to see without a microscope, however. Mayflies often have kind of fragile, delicate gills on most of their abdominal segments, although these are, again, kind of fragile and could be broken off um, in the collection process. And then they usually have three tails. Um, and remember that uh, stoneflies have just two tails. But they have, they're generally um, kind of a similar size and similar coloring, similar body shape, so they can be confused. But look for the gills, and then if they have three tails, then you know you're looking at a mayfly and not a stonefly. But you can even see in the picture on the right that one of the tails is broken. Yeah, it's broken off. Off all the way, but that's very, very common. Um, so dragon and damselfly nymphs, they're another one that could be confused. Um, they both have distinctive antennae. And one of the ones, if you've been to our fall or spring bug hunt, we catch a lot of Coleopterygidae damselflies. And they have pretty distinct antenna in that like their first antennal segment is really, really long. So it kind of makes their overall antenna long. But it's you can even see that just with your naked eye. And then a couple of the dragonfly nymphs have more like really short kind of club-like antennae. So they can be kind of distinctive. They uh, both have pretty large eyes. Um, and then they also have a, it's almost like an elbow kind of like um, mouth part that can extend um, and project away from the head. And that's kind of how they strike and seize their prey. And then it tucks kind of right right under their head when it's not in use. And um, 
those are those two. And then I think the next slide, they go into a little bit more. So the dragonflies in general have a little bit stouter body shape and they don't have tails. So the remember the, the stoneflies have kind of the two long tails or Circe and dragonflies don't. They're generally pretty short and they're a little bit stouter. But then the, the damselflies do have a slender body. Um, again, they have that kind of long, like projecting mouth part. And then they do have three tails or this caudal lamella that are actually their gills. Um, but again, they're not kind of like long and straight. These are more like paddle. They look a little bit more like paddles um, and there's three of them. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. And so then I was going to let Sue, if, she, if you're willing, um, go into the kind of family level identification. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, the next uh, series of slides uh, were, more, were more designed for when we were in, um, in person in a lab, actually to look at specimens under the, the microscope, because some of the features that we're looking at are pretty pretty small, and you need the you need the aid of the microscope to help with the differentiation to go into um, to the family to the family level. Um, as as Lauren shared in the presentation, we the goal is, is when we're in the field is to be identifying the uh, the general mouth part the, the general structures of the stonefly. Here you have a stonefly, and then when we get into the lab to verify the specimens to identify the family, we'd be using um, these types of uh, uh, identifiers, but some of them are uh, in larger specimens that you'd actually be able to see them in the field. So, um, but I'll be going through the the um, some of the characteristics of the the commonly found stoneflies families that are found within within the rouge, uh, the Capnidaes, the the winter stoneflies, um, Taeniopteridae is one we do find occasionally, um, and then. Per Perlidae, which also is is a, a little bit more rare, and then Perloded, and uh, is one that's a little bit more common, especially finding quite a bit in uh, Johnson Creek and more of the headwater streams uh, of the lower the lower Rouge um, and even the the Middle Rouge. So, um, in the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is um this is the big differentiator between the uh, the stonefly families is. Is is talked about in the presentation earlier. Is looking as a collector, we're looking for the various habitats that the stoneflies are are found in in the stream when we're sampling thoroughly at the site. Um, so the the mouth parts are uh, how the how the insect is is um, is consuming its food. So whether or not we're getting the predators or the shredders or the detritivores. The um, makes a big difference with uh, for the identification portion when you're looking at the specimens under the microscope. So, so the picture here, not to get into the weeds with uh, the paraglossae and the glossae with um, the the lat the Latin uh, the Latin terms, but the mouth parts for the for the sh for the uh, predators, the ones on the left there with the larger picture, it's the their had the. The um, the mouth parts are what's called subequal, or their their one is larger or longer than the others. As when you look at the the picture on the right, you see that they're pretty much straight across with the same length. Um, so these projections do help the um, the predator hang on to prey to be able to to consume it um, to 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 um, to eat it. And then the the shredders to the right, you see the kind of they can just use and kind of chomp on. Uh, the leaf, the leaf um, in detritus uh, to break that down, um, but those are those are two things. When you look, when you're using a key and looking at the specimens, that would be your first identifier, other than the two tails and the antennae and the general body shape to start identifying to um, the family level. Um, next slide, please. So this is a this is another characteristic for um, for the stonefly families as well as. Uh, the wing pads and some of this is challenging depending on the the age of the, the specimen because depending the the wing pads will evolve as the as the insect starts to to uh, mature going through the various stages before it hatches into a, a winged adult um so sometimes we'll get a specimen that's a little bit more immature and the wing pads may not be as developed. So sometimes the divergence and, and that isn't as easy to see. But in these particular pictures here, 
um, if you were to, to draw imaginary lines straight down, straight down the middle of the back, the dorsal side of the, the insect, um, you look and the wing pads will actually be kind of varying out at angling out from the from the, the midpoint, like you can see in the picture on the left, you know, they're kind of angling out. Um, and then the picture on the right, which is more of our catnade or more common stonefly, the, the wing pads are, are fairly straight in line with the body right up and down. They're not, you know, flaring out um, to the side. So those are your two differentiations between several of the, the different families uh, when it comes to, to the ID. Um, next. So here's um, some here's some characteristics of the first, uh, the more common, the most common stonefly that we find in uh, the rouge. And these again um, um, are best seen under under the microscope. Um, and uh, the macro, I think the macroinvertebrates.org um, website, you can actually zoom in on some of the pictures there, and so you can you can actually see some of these these characteristics, and they have really good pictures that help show these. Um, but uh, with the uh, slender winter stonefly, um, they are shredder the detritivores, de de so they're living. Uh, we're going to ha be hanging out in the, 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 those nice, uh, nice uh, leaf packs in the stream. So this is a this is one of the insects that does have the parallel the parallel <clears throat> excuse me the parallel wing pads. So you look in the body, it'll be, be it'll be straight down. You won't see the flaring divergence with with the wing pads. And um, if you were to turn um, the insect on its side under the microscope and zoom in, you can actually see in the picture on the left, there's like this little, there's little fold along its abdomen, the, the long, the long section there. And you can actually see this, this line where the, where the fold is. And these typically have very long, uh, very long tails and um, antennae as well. But these also have the mouth parts here. So it's a detritive war, so it has the, equal mouth parts, not the, not the ones that are um, of unequal length. So, um, next, please. Uh, Go ahead. Um, I'm going to just show this macroinvertebrates.org because this is really cool for people to look at for the cap name. So they have those characteristics and you can also kind of zoom in and see that. Um, and you can click on each of the um, kind of to the right under the diagnostic characteristics. Yeah, like Gil's absent, it'll zoom right into what you're supposed to look for, things like that. So it's really helpful for if you're not all, sometimes the, you know, the keys can use these words that you don't know what it means or like what part of the bug you're supposed to be looking at. So this is really great. Like, you know, the paraglossa and glossa sub equal, like, okay, well, what does that mean? Let me click on it and it shows you exactly what you're supposed to be looking at. So I, I love this website. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it, it's it's a great it's a great website, um, and this is uh, and the, the pictures are really helpful. Like like Lauren said, some you're looking at the a drawing in the key, and and sometimes it's and then you're zooming in depending on the age of uh, the size of the specimen. Sometimes you're trying to 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 make some of the some of the features out. So sometimes it's more difficult than others. And sometimes you use actually multiple keys and everything else to try to figure some of these things out too. So, um, but yeah, the, those, that, that website is highly recommended uh, to, to use as a, as a guide to learn. And then also like when you are um, uh, identifying specimens. Um, so next, please. Um, the next, uh, next family here that's also a detritivore um, is is a Taniap today, and it's called a broadback uh, stonefly. And so these also are uh, shredder, shredders, you're going to be finding them. They live in the more larger um, river um, river um, sources, and that's this is actually the one we found on, on the main. Um, they do, they're found occasionally in, in some of the other, uh, other tributaries. Um, but these, um, this one you can see in this picture um, on the left there, you can see this one has very divergent wing pants compared to compared to the slender winter stonefly that we just saw. So you can see how how big that flare out is. So that's that's pretty distinctive in this particular family. Um, these also have what's called a uh, coxal gill. So when you're flipping um, the insect over on its um, over on its back, they actually see under the under the where the hip where the leg of the insect attaches into the body, you actually see that there's these the gill. Um, it's kind of all like this little little thumb whitish thumb thumbish thing um, hanging out of the hanging out of the hip area there um, in the uh, the legs. And so the, another 
um, another uh, feature is the tarsal segment and that's uh, um, on the leg is when you look and one, one will be shorter than the other, um, but you've got the other differentiating features uh, that will be um, more more apparent to you even than looking at that one. But um, that's, uh, that's a Terry uh, tear today. Um, next, please. Um, so another at least uh, one of the lesser common uh, stoneflies in the Rouge is uh, Nibiridae, um, which is uh, also called brown stoneflies. And this is another another shredder. So it has the, the uh, mouth parts that are of equal length across. Um, so they tend to be found in the, the leaf packs um, hanging out in there. These are ones that look um, kind of hairy. If you were just to collect them, they look like they've got fur growing out on them <laughs> compared to some of the other stoneflies, which, which don't have that look. Um, this is another family that also has the, the divergent wing pads um, when you do see them. They're not quite as you know, super flary as our Artaniap here today, but it is it is pretty distinctive. Uh, some of the some of the species may also have uh, gills on the on the neck, um, just below the the head, and that'd be look more like the, the Frankenstein look, you know, for for Halloween. Um, so you may see those, um, and then also the tarsal segments uh, have different different uh, length as opposed to like our, our slender wind or sunfly, where they're all the same. They're all the same length. So um, next. Um, here's another of a common family in the Rouge, typically up in um, Denson Creek. We find this uh, quite uh, commonly is uh, perloted. Um, and as you can see by the picture, uh, they're very, they're very pretty. They have a, a, what they're called pattern stoneflies because of their, their coloration. So they tend to blend in really well with um, rocks and, and sand and, and things on the bottom um, and for camouflage. Uh, so these are ones you might find in rocks and you know, leaf packs hanging out because these are these are first families that we're seeing now that are that are the carnivores. Um, they have this is where the mouth parts are subequal and they have the, the dif differentiating size um, of the mouth parts. So that would be one of our our, our characteristics here. Um, and the, these do not have gills on their um, their thorax um, at all. Um, you will not see gills on on these at all, as compared to some of the other uh, families. So these also the wing pads are somewhat divergent. They're not as strong as the other the other two families that we just saw. But if, when you look at that midline, you'll see that the the wing pads are not straight up and down like with our uh, with our our Capnaeidae, which is our perfect example of the parallel wing pads. Um, so these also have very long, um, very long, fine antennae and tails as, as well with these specimens. But they are, um, we get some beautiful uh, uh, perloteds up at uh, John 8, if you happen to be fortunate enough to get that site and go sample there. Um, next, please. <clears throat> Our next uh, family that we tend to find out in, in Johnson Creek uh, occasionally is, is uh, uh, perlidae. Um, these are what's called common stoneflies, and you can tell by the the body pattern that they could be confused uh, with the smaller um, perlidae. Um, but these are also predators, so again, they have the the so the unequal mouth parts. Uh, they tend to hang out under logs and stones. Uh, if you flip over a stone, you might might find some um, on those. So they're they're stalking uh, the other insects within leaf packs. So these are ones the differentiation between these and the uh, perloteds is that these have the um, in the picture there you can see they have the thoracic gills. Um, so when you turn them over, you can actually see the the white the fine the fine gills on their abdomen. So these are the ones that do that do the push ups because they're very sensitive um, to oxygen levels. So if you were actually to capture them in the tray. Um, it's enough of an oxygen deferation if they're not in flowing water that they'll do the they'll they'll do the push ups to to keep the to keep the um, oxygen going over over their gills. So um, there's I think there's some YouTube videos out there on that show that, and so it's to give you an idea what that what that looks like. But they're also very beautiful. Have um, the pattern the pattern um, the the pattern body uh, uh, coloration similar to the to the uh, the perloted. Um, and so these also have the uh, the divergent wing pads as well, and the very long uh, antennae and, and tails. Um, 
So next. Okay, um, just some things on uh, bug ID tips is uh, we talked about one just with uh, the, the fantastic website that has the pictures and the key, uh, the macrovertebrates.org. That's a wonderful, and the, the app uh, that you can have on your phone as well. Those are it's a wonderful key to help uh, differentiate out these features. And um, one thing we recommend is, of course, today, if uh, if the weather wouldn't have, if it would have cooperated with us, so we would have been actually been able to look uh, live and in person at some of the uh, specimen samples to get you a chance to practice um, doing the ID with a key and, and learning what the um, what the uh, what the features look like. But uh, we encourage you to attend when um, Friends of the Rouge has um, uh, the team leader trainings, or, or when we do uh, bug ID night for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, the spring and fall collections. This is a great time to practice and and uh, actually get to practice ID. So it's a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, other things are just the reference uh, reference keys and, and some text and. Um, we uh, talked about is just with uh, the website there. And um, if you have some keys is just practice, just uh, learning just uh, differentiations just for the order level for like when you're out in the field uh, leading your team. Uh, and then when you get into the lab and, and work uh, at a bug ID night is to just practice using the keys when you're uh, differentiating specimens. Um, the way the keys are laid out is um, they're going to be presenting the most common and the reliable characters first. And then as you get further into the description of a particular um, a feature, then that's less and less common as you get to, you know, toward the way they're listed. So like for instance, two tails would be one of the, the characteristics for stoneflies or the mouth parts being sub-equal or not, you know, to help you um, differentiate specimens. Also keep in mind the keys are based on somewhat the mature specimen. So if you are uh, getting a, a, a less mature specimen, sometimes like the, like I said, the wing pads may not be as 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 divergent. So sometimes it may make, since the, the, spe the features aren't as distinctive, it may be a little bit more challenging to identify a specimen to family or, 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 or further. Um, so also key with verifying is since you saw in the, uh, the pictures we showed you today is that some of the, some of the, um, some of the specimens look similar, um, and that until you get very comfortable with differentiating the, the features is, is to, you know, key things out to, and not just look at the picture, say, oh, it's a per, you know, perlid stonefly and not the, you know, the perloded to be able to know the, the differentiations between those. Um, and if you do get stuck, if you're using a key and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I have, is is the key ties you back to the, the feature before. So if you have to, you know, start over, because sometimes if you do miss a characteristic and then it will take you into a different, um, a, a different level of insect and then you're sitting there going, hmm, I don't know if this is right. So um Sometimes you do need to start over, but um, key here is is with anything is is just practicing, and, and the more the more um, the more uh, specimens that you look at, or the more you're involved in watching how they behave, like when you're collecting, um, that's so that's very helpful in in getting more confident with um, with ID. Um, next, here's some. Um, here's some references and photo credits. So if you uh, want to explore on your own to um, to look at um, IDs and, and try to uh, brush up on on what uh, things look like. These are some these are some great um, resources online and also books. And I maybe when we update this, I totally forgot when we were putting this together is to actually add the macroinvertebrates link in there. But um, but these are all great ones. Uh, with uh, Friends of the Rouge has the the MyCore presentation uh, for team leaders, but the Vachelle book is is a very good uh, very good one to have. It has great great uh, great photos, great descriptions of of the different uh, of the different families, and so all these all these um, all these are really good resources to to take a look at. So. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Sue. Um... Now, let me do a step share here. So uh, that was um, 
a light dive and then a deep dive into stoneflies. And for those of you newbies who've never been out, you know, if you could just find a stonefly, that's great. Um, the family stuff is just, you know, additional information and we will be doing that in the lab. Um, so we are about, or actually a little bit past time, we started a little bit later. Um, so I would say we could stick around for, I think the presenters are willing to stick around a little bit more um, as long as uh, Lauren's fingers haven't frozen solid in her power hole or uh, um, her uh, power holes out on her computer. Um, but uh, I can open it up now for anybody who has any questions. And if anybody would like, I could put the quiz on. So Anybody wants to put a, a question in or let us know in chat if you'd like to. I have a quiz just to, for stoneflies in general or for uh, the family. I, I think we'll start with stoneflies in general. Um, so any, any questions? Um, uh, so first question here, Brenda is asking, is stream water used to rinse equipment? Um, yes, you will be out in the field. And yes, if you can just kind of try to get all the stuff off of your equipment in the field. Um, for our monitoring events, we generally send you to two sites that are within the same watershed. So while it's important to try to clean everything off and not transfer bugs or anything else to the next site, it's within the same watershed. If we ever do send you to a site that's within a different, uh, not watershed per se, but sub watershed, you know, say a different branch, then we actually would send you out with disinfection equipment, a diluted bleach solution to spray and leave for 10 minutes and then some fresh water to rinse off. Um, but for stonefly search, you will be within the same tributary, most likely, not to mention subwatershed. But great question. Are we a, uh, so next question from Leo. Are we able to observe stoneflies by using, um, let me see, there's another question. Let me go back. Are we able to observe stoneflies by using microscopes in the lab? Um, since we're not collecting as many specimens for um, the stonefly search, we don't generally hold an ID night. Um, but if you are really interested in coming to our lab, um, talk to us, talk to Sam, talk to Lauren or one of us, or shoot us an email. Um, we we have a lot of, we will be doing this in-house, so if, um, we could probably have you come in. Um, and after our spring and fall bug hunts, we always hold a night for team leaders and those interested to help um, identify bugs. Um, somebody else want to take the next question? No, actually, you guys haven't done this as much. Um, I guess I'll, I'll continue. If the site is frozen, how do you recommend we sample the site? And I think Lauren or, or, or Sue could um, pitch in because they've done this a lot. Um, if the site is frozen, you want to just find some areas where you can crack through the ice. Um, we do recommend if you have um, like a pickaxe or an ice pick like they use for ice fishing to bring that along. Um, so we would we uh, would recommend that you just find places that it looks thinner and that you can crack through the ice. And obviously it's going to limit the amount of stream that you can sample. Um, so but try to get in in a few places if you can. Um, I don't know if Sue or Lauren have any recommendations about when you're out there, how to do that. Yeah, if I, in my experience, it's just been breaking through the ice as best as you can. And, um, you know, if it's completely frozen, you're just not going to be able to get to certain areas. Um, but to you can also, if it's just kind of frozen on the top, you can also try to like wrangle your net underneath you know if like if just the the surface is frozen um you can try to like you know get your sample your net underneath um in the water and like dig around under where it's frozen um but you know if it's just completely frozen yeah you just you can't sample certain areas that's okay great um i'm going to kind of combine the two questions because they're both about um the specimens and the ethanol and um, I, I, one of the slides did say collect five to six. Um, you know, we, in the past, that was what we did for uh, all of our benthic macroinvertebrates, just ask you to collect five to six of each different type 
Um, but we've changed that now. And for our regular spring and fall, we're collecting everything. For the stonefly search, you know, if you get 50 stoneflies, we don't really want to have you taking all 50 stoneflies. Um, so uh, our general recommendation is, you know, five to six. And if you do notice that you have um, different families, that's why it was helpful for you to kind of see that. Like if you have some that have the divergent wings or those kind of patterns on them, along with probably most likely we'll find the slender winter ones. Make sure that you get, you know, four or five of each different type, or if you only have one of the different types, make sure that you get that because, um, you know, we want as that is an important, you know, so the on um, with this event on the one level, it's do you have stoneflies at all is, um, you know, the big thing we're looking for, but then secondly, we're looking to see do you have more than one family at the site, so definitely try to go for a variety. Um. And, and, you know, something about the ice cube trays. So we provide the ice cube trays just so you can pull the bugs out. And most likely at your site, you're going to pull other things out of the sample. You're going to find some net spinner caddis flies. You're going to find, you know, there's a few other things that will be active out there. Um, that's kind of what the, the ice cube trays are there for, to do the separation. Um, but again, we're only collecting the stone flies um, and not all of them. Well, and, and one other thing is, so if, if you're really unsure and if your team is really unsure about whether or not it's a stonefly, we'd rather have you collect it than not collect it. So on the off chance that it is a stonefly, we'd rather have, so, you know, if everyone on the team is kind of confused, thinking it could be, we'd rather you collect it. And then we can double check in the lab because, you know, we're trying to collect or, you know, trying to capture these elusive stoneflies. So um, if you're unsure, you can collect, but... Um, Try to try to think through um, all of the different kind of tips that we've given you to to ID one versus the other. So I think that's all the questions, um, and I think let's just be cognizant of time um, and um, also that our leaders are both out of power, <laughs> Sam and Lauren. So we don't want Lauren to get too much colder. Um, so. Uh, I guess in closing, thank you so much for volunteering for this. Um, we will be sending out your site. Uh, actually, no, we don't. We're not sending out the site assignments um, except for to the team leader. Are we sending those out to the team leaders in advance? Yeah, we can send them out to the team leaders, and then <clears throat> excuse me, and then team members will uh, will get all of that information um, at the Plymouth Cultural Center on Saturday. Yeah, we're a little bit in transition, you know, during COVID, we would actually send that to you and you would just meet at the site, but we've always preferred to have you meet at a central location, get some bagels and donuts, see all the other people going out to sites, meet your team leader, um, and make sure when you get there that you immediately find your team, introduce yourself and get all set up, that it's easy to just go eat donuts in the corner, but please don't do that. Go grab your donut and then meet your team, hang out with your team, figure out what you're doing. Um, so, uh, but we will let the team leaders know just so they can be a little bit more um, prepared uh, for that. Um, so, so uh, yeah, look for some reminder emails, reminders about what to bring and what to wear. And don't know as just to emphasize a little bit more about what to bring and what to wear is that especially team leaders, if they have a table and uh, team members, uh, it's helpful to bring a chair um, if you like to sit and pick. Sometimes it's awkward uh, to be standing. Um, and some people even bring, I know that Bill uh, Eisenman even has these cool little TV trays, if you remember those things, um, like a nice little table that makes it a little bit more comfortable out there. And again, lots of warm clothes, maybe some warm soup or hot chocolate or coffee in a thermos. Um, so uh, we really look forward to seeing you next Saturday. Predictions are for some, some pretty good cold. So get those long johns and wool socks and hats and gloves and those kinds of things all set. So anybody else have anything else? No, just thank you all so much for registering and yeah, and for attending this webinar. I know it's, <laughs> it's cold and snowy outside. So um, we're looking forward to seeing you on Saturday and um, yeah, excited to hopefully find some stoneflies. It's great to see everyone here today and um, even more excited to see you all in person uh, next week. Uh, so have a great rest of your weekend. 
a long weekend. Um, hopefully you, you do something, something good for your community for MLK day on Monday. Um, and we will see you on Saturday to uh, hear all about it. Thanks everybody.